greetings in Jesus' name. I'm Bishop Chester Wright, and this is the Call to War 2020 video briefing number 12. Uh, in the last uh, video briefing, number 11, uh, I introduced a subject uh, that I really need to go into greater depth on, if if you would permit me. Uh, talked about the fact that in this current crisis that we are in, which as I have said, while God did not cause it, he has definitely allowed it. Just like he allowed uh, Satan in Job's life to do certain things. There was a limit God put on it. Uh, he allowed it to go so far and he put a limit on it. Uh, some have a real problem with this because their idea of God is one they've created in their own minds because they have not studied the word enough to find out who God says he is and how he thinks and how he feels about things. And they have not studied the word of God enough to see how God uh, does things. And he does things like this. He, he cannot do evil, but he will allow, give permission for things to happen for the purpose of getting people's attention because eternity is forever, and those that do not uh, give themselves to him so that he can save them because he cannot save and will not save anybody against their will. Uh, he is doing whatever he's got to do to help us see things from his perspective. And frankly, there is no other perspective. So here we are uh, in this country, and more and more the restrictions are, are becoming fairly uniform. There are states that have very, very ri rigid restrictions going on right now and some that aren't yet as rigid. But it won't be long. I'm telling you they're right that now what I know in the Holy Ghost, it won't really be wrong long until these restrictions are going to be fairly common across this country because what the governor of California done has done in shutting everything down and having everybody stay home except absolutely essential people to keep life working uh, is exactly what the president of the United States has been contemplating doing now it's a big discussion of who has the authority to do that, the federal government of the states, not my problem. In the state of Maryland, <laughs> our governor has already uh, come all the way down to no gatherings of more than 10 people, and I'm assuming that doesn't count immediate family, but uh, no gatherings of the public of more than 10 people. And he's made it very clear that's law and that he is going to enforce that. Uh, but here we are, uh, everything that we know about our traditional Christianity, the Christianity that those of us have either grown up in or that we've been saved into, uh, has just about been shut down. And if this is all the way God wants it to be done, then poor old God, he has been thwarted. But what if he's trying to get our attention? And the most fundamental issue here is, are the saved supposed to have a relationship with him only or primarily through the church and church services? Or is, according to his will, his word, his plan, his principles, is each individual supposed to have a personal relationship with God? And as I said in the last video, and there's only a few things that I will be repeating here so that we can get to the point where I'd like to go forward from, uh, this is the purest form of Christianity in my lifetime where people are having to confront whether or not they know God for themselves, whether or not they have a true personal relationship with God for themselves, or, if, or has... Their entire relationship with God been church and church service oriented. Now, it's not either or. 
but we've been so far in the pendulum swung the other day, other way uh, toward it all being about church. Uh, and very a very small percentage of the body of Christ. And I'm not exaggerating here. It's really easy to know right now. All the people that are supposed to be saved, that are panicking and are terrified and whatever, all of that is revealing that they're emotionally and spiritually dependent upon the church getting together and having these services and everything being like we're used to them being and all of that. And there are preachers that are panicking because they don't know any other way to minister but inside a church building in a church service. And again, it is absolutely the will of God, the biblical principle for the body of Christ together, periodically together. Uh, The early church did it every day, but we know today you can't get people to do that. So we've cut it back and cut it back and cut it back. And, and proving that we don't really believe that's the only way it's supposed to happen, but because that's what people have been so dependent upon, they don't know how to do it any other way. And so a personal relationship with God, really, where I feed myself out of the Word of God, where I talk to God for myself and hear from God for myself, a uh, very small percentage that's really comfortable with that. Uh, teach a Bible study or have a personal Bible study in my home or somebody else's, there's still a lot of people that are, they're uncomfortable with that. Have a, have a small group in my house. <clears throat> uh, I, I don't know if I want people in my house. You know, it's, that's, that's the problem we have, see. It's, uh, we're not comfortable with all that. What we're really comfortable with, no matter how small the the, uh, the crowd or how w- what type of facility is, if we can call it a church, rented or purchased or whatever, we're comfortable with that. That's what we're used to. But we're not able to do that now, are we? And if that is the will of God for the way it's to be done, then God is impotent because he can't keep that happening. And Many don't even want to consider that God is the one that's allowed it to get like this. Why? He's trying to get our attention. And I testified in the last uh, briefing about my personal experience of being sent in the will of God to the Naval Academy where there was no church in this town then. Uh, That's the, this is the place that my wife and I came in September of 1970 to build a church because there was no church of our faith here my whole four years. There was no preacher here to to, to hear from, to counsel with. There was no church here to gather with. There were no, no people of our faith in this city during those four years. And I found out very quickly that my relationship was not with God directly, It was with the church. And whatever I knew of him, I only knew through the church. And whatever I knew about his word, I only knew from my Sunday school teacher and my youth leader and my pastor. And I found out very quickly that God was not happy about that. There's a lot of folks. There's pastors that are are terrified that people are going to backslide like this. Let me tell you what. If an individual is in danger of backsliding because of this situation, the real question is whether or not they were biblically saved. That's the real question here. Because a person with a personal relationship with God, a saint, a believer, a disciple, call it whatever you want to call them, church member, which is not a biblical terminology, but member of the body of Christ, but we use the terminology church member different than we do member of the body of Christ. And, you know, we're, we're, people are, are not uh, used to having to know Jesus for themselves. Now, some, of course, thank God for those that do. But, oh, I'm sorry to say, and if most pastors would be very, very honest right now, it's easily less than 50% that they're worried about that aren't going to make it through this because they don't know Jesus. They don't have a relationship with him. They don't know how to pray. 
They don't know how to connect with God. They don't know how to be fed themselves out of the Bible. And so it's very precarious right now. And so when we're worried about how much of a body of Christ is going to be left after all this, uh, all of the body of Christ is going to be left, but a lot of folks that we have assumed or thought were a part of the body of Christ, not going to be. Jesus prayed the night, uh, the evening of the night that he was that he went out to Gethsemane uh, uh, later, and he prayed there for himself. And then the mob came and and took him prisoner with his permission. They don't realize how much that he let them do that. Sometime in the early morning hours uh, after midnight, but the night before he prayed, and he said, "Father." Uh, he was praying for us. He said, uh, I haven't lost any that you gave me but the son of perdition. Now, wait a minute. What about those thousands of people that he healed and fed and ministered to that weren't following him when he prayed that prayer? He's acknowledging they were never his because he didn't lose any by his own statement. He didn't lose any that God had given him, that the Father God had given the man Christ Jesus in his ministry. He didn't lose any of them. So I'm not the least bit worried about losing people who are a part of the body of Christ. I am concerned about losing those who are only members of Antioch and attenders of Antioch. And rightfully so. And the reason we're concerned is because whether we're acknowledging it with our minds or not, in our spirit, we know these people are not in a saved condition. Because they can't, other than the, the, the ones that have gotten sick, and that's still out of 350 million, give or take 20 million people in this country, there's only been about a hundred and 20 or so that's died, and, and, and it's not, I'm not saying only 120. If they're, if they're your loved one, it's not 120 to you, but I'm talking statistically here. Statistically. Right now, 120 people out of over 300 million, and we're all terrified and whatever. How did all, how did that? That, I mean, what has it been? Over 20,000 people that have died of the flu in this country so far this year, and nobody's shutting down church over that? You've got to acknowledge that there's more behind this than a virus and a government that's panicking. There's more behind it. Well, a lot of folks don't want to think like this, but God is behind it. Say, well, he's letting people die. Yes, and he said, precious on the side of the Lord is the death of his saints. And he also said, the word of God says that it's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. And that appointment with death is set for every one of us before we're even brought into this world. In the mind of God, that day and time of our death is predetermined. Now, my salvation can't be predetermined because it's got to be at my will. But the scripture teaches very plainly that no man has the power to retain the spirit in the time of death. You can choose to live all you want, but you can't stay alive when it's time, your time to go. You can't. And so that being the case, our loving, gracious, kind Righteous, holy, heavenly Father has allowed this to get the attention of his church. Oh, he's getting the attention of the world too, but he's getting the attention of the church. I mean, that I've said it already in, a, in one of these briefings, but the president calls a national day of prayer and the, uh, 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 the, uh, uh, those 
that those atheist legal groups that are out there trying to eliminate people kneeling on a football field or having baptismal services or having invocations at, at, at the city or county level meetings. What, haven't heard a word out of them, have you? No, they're smarter than that. They know good and well. They'd do, be doing themselves a disservice. I wonder who the atheist is praying to with their fear and terror about this virus. I wonder who that is. I wonder who they're praying for. The governor yesterday in Maryland talked about limiting the groups to 10 people, talked about how serious this was, and we needed to take it serious. And there's been, what, uh, 30 people died in Maryland out of over 6 million? And everything is stopping because of this? Well, I'm not saying what they're doing is wrong. I'm just simply saying there's more behind this than a virus. The spread of this may be called pandemic, but we haven't seen hundreds of thousands of people die yet. We're taking all these actions with 130 in this country, approximately. And again, I have compassion on everybody that's gotten this virus. I have compassion praying for everybody that's gotten the virus in or out of the church. I have compassion on anyone who has uh, got a family member that's died from this virus. I don't care how old they are. At 74, let me tell you something. Life is really short. You can say, well, they lived a full life. You know who the people are that say they've lived a full life? Those that are young and haven't died yet. Because who determines how long a full life is? So here we are. Here we are. And if we keep denying, and, and there are Christians and preachers that are apologizing for God. He didn't cause this. No, he didn't cause it. He sure let it happen. And he's in control of the extent of it. Just like he limited what Lucifer or what Satan could do in Job's life and family. Just like God limited it on two separate occasions, he's limited this. We haven't reached the limit yet. We haven't reached the limit yet. And those that are hoping this is going to be open over in April, <laughs> oh, God help us. If you're so full of fear and you're so un in, uh, not in tune with the Spirit that you think this is going to be over in another few weeks, we're not even, we're barely at the beginning of this. I'm not a negative person, and I'm not afraid at all, but I talk to God. And he's not done. He's not done with this till he gets the attention of his church. Whether anybody else pays attention or not, he is going to get the attention of his church. He's going to get the attention of his church. We're going to pray through. Or some are going to backslide because they're going to be bitter with God because he's interrupted their lives and their lifestyle. I'll tell you what, the love of God has no obligation to your or my comfort or convenience in the temporal world. All that, everything that the love of God is obligated to be concerned about is your eternal destination. According to the word of God, everything he has done ultimately was to give us a chance to be saved, spend eternity with him rather than eternity in a place beyond any imagination to be able to conceive of how horrible. And you can do your philosophical debates about heaven and hell all you want and what a good God would do or do, wouldn't do. Well, that's really easy to talk about all that stuff at a time not like this. But when every human being right now is potentially looking at the possibility of fatal death, if every one of us is looking at that possibility, what, what are we going to do? What's, what's going to be our response to that? How are you going to respond to God, my friend? How am I going to respond to God? There are believers who are angry with God for letting this happen. 
And we prayed that he wouldn't let it happen, and he, he has let it happen. No, not yet. It's just getting started because he, is, he cannot give in time worldwide apostolic revival and harvest to a church that is more involved with churchianity than they are with apostolic Christianity. He can't do it. When our commitment is more to tradition than it is to the Word of God and what the Word of God actually says, when, I, when, when, when it's the opinions of people and the opinions of, of preachers and other saints have more sway in our lives than what the Word of God says, He loves you and me, friend, way too much to just let the norm go on. I have waited all my life for this day. I have lived all my life for this time. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of the end. And oh, I know. He's already told me. It's going to get better at some point. It's going to get better for a little while. But it's not going to be long. It's going to be better. Be better. Because <laughs> all of this, all of this, the world needs to blame somebody. And when they begin to blame God, they're going to be angry with everybody that still believes in God and is trying to follow him. Yeah, because the scripture teaches there's persecution coming. Well, they don't need to persecute us when we're trying to fit in with them, when we're trying to win their approval, when we're trying to build our crowds through whatever means we can, whether it's biblical or not. They don't have to, they're not worried about us. They're not trying to become like us. We're trying to fit into their culture so they can be comfortable when they come to our gatherings. How's that working out right now? How's that working out? It is time for the church to be the church. But the church can't be the church unless the people of the church, the members of the church, are what they're supposed to be in God. I, the Lord gave me this this morning, uh, and, and, and let me... Uh, we talk about this just a just a moment here. Uh, what 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 is our spiritual focus? Well, in my lifetime, and especially during my ministry, the primary spiritual focus has been the body. But is that what's supposed to be our focus? The and the body, the crowd, or is the focus of ministry supposed to be each individual member of the body? There can be no health in the body without the members of the body being healthy first. That's true whether it's our natural bodies or the spiritual body. Even one member of the body being spiritually unhealthy, sick, in pain, infected, etc., arrests the attention of the whole body. <clears throat> That's true again, whether it's naturally or spiritually. I can be the epitome of health and have a toothache, just one toothache. And my entire focus of the body is on that tooth. I could be the epitome of health and have an infected, ingrown toenail. And my whole focus is on that toenail. It changes everything. It changes how I walk. It changes what I do. My healthy body can't do because of that infected toenail. So the health, the purpose of God what he's doing through the body, it has to start with our focus on the individual people and their relationship with God. Again, health, the health of the body does not start with a whole body with a whole body focus. It begins with an individual member focus. If any type of structure of human beings, in any type of structure of human beings, the weakest link def defines the strength of the whole. Like in football. You can have 10 all pros on offense, but one weak link can allow the quarterback to be sacked on a crucial play to win the game because we're only as strong as our weakest link. We're only as strong, the church is only as strong as the weakest 
saint. Because we are not called to grow a crowd. We are called to grow saints. We're called to grow people. That's our responsibility. Paul, Paul, in his diagnosis of the Ephesians, he said in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 12, and I want to say in advance before I quote these verses or paraphrase them, which means I'm not going to quote them exactly right, that uh, 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 the book of Hebrews wasn't written to preachers. It was written to all believers. And he said in Ephesians 5, 12, when for the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need for one to teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of Christ. And have become babes in need of milk because strong meat belongs to those that are of full age, but those that are unskillful in the word are babes. That's not preachers. That's the people of the body of Christ. Now, on the day of Pentecost, there were 120 believers there, but only 12 apostles, counting the newly uh, appointed Matthias. Well, 3,000 people got saved. That means each one of the 12 would have to baptize 250. I don't know if you can do that in one day. But how about if all 120 were baptizing? Oh, horror of horrors. Only preachers can baptize. I'd like to see that. I'd like to see book, chapter, and verse for that. I believe that the pastor, the ministry, has the right to commission and train many people to baptize. And the revival I'm believing for, it, you're not going to be able to have preachers do all the baptizing. Not going to be able to do it. So if each individual was commissioned to baptize, they would only have 25 baptized to baptize. Most I've ever been, been able to baptize or had opportunity to baptize at one time was 33. I baptized all 33 of those people myself in the river at their request. Took me about two hours. And it was on the Sunday night, March the 31st, whatever year that was. It was in the 70s, 77, 78, somewhere in there. And uh, it was not cold except in the water. And the breeze was blowing in toward the shore. And so every time I baptized somebody, I baptized in them into the wave. And when I did, the water splashed up on me. And by the time I got to the last couple, I was numb from the neck down. I couldn't feel anything. And the last person I baptized was, was a lady who was not slim. And uh, when I baptized her, I had no feeling whatsoever in my hands. And when my hands came up out of the water, there was nobody in my hands. And immediately there flashed in my mind the front page of our local newspaper, woman drowns being baptized by, in my name, and the name of the church. And a few seconds later, she got herself up out of the water about 15 feet from me. And she was all okay, and I don't even think she fully realized that I lost her under the water. They had to carry me to the car, and I, it took 30 minutes in the car with the heat on high for me to get the feeling back in my body. But that was over two hours to baptize those 33. So what are we going, what are we going to do? How, how are we going to prepare the church for the revival we claim we believe is going to happen? It's sure not going to happen in a church building. It's not going to happen in a church building. We don't have enough capacity in all of our churches, and we're, we don't, we're not going to be willing to have enough church services for everybody to come to at least one service a week. Not the revival I'm believing for. Now, if you can fit the revival you're believing for in a building, God bless you, not me. So how's all this going to happen? Again, in the last uh, briefing, I shared my testimony at the, at the academy. And I, uh, going there and finding out, God demonstrating to me that I did not have a relationship with him. I only had a relationship with the church. The church was how I, I it wasn't about me. I didn't have this relationship about me. So there, there are people, good people, who they're praying right now, but they're praying against the virus. Now you can pray against the virus all you want. I'm not. What I'm praying is, God, what are you trying to say to me through this? 
What are you trying to teach me through this? What message from you am I supposed to be hearing in this? Because if I hear the message and respond to the message, it leaves, the whole thing will change when that happens. But if all I'm praying about is, God, get take this off of me, don't let me get sick, whatever, whatever, whatever out of my fear, my panic, I'm proving I'm not trying to get the message. The other message I'm sending is, I don't believe God is God, and I don't believe he's in control, and so therefore I believe this is the devil fighting me. I'm not trying to be sarcastic. I'm trying to make a point. I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm trying to get you to think. Paul said in Romans 12, 2, that transformation takes place by a renewing of your mind or a changing in your thoughts. And what is the purpose for our transformation, our renewing of our mind? That we might know what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. There's not, those aren't three dimensions of the will of God. There are three adjectives qualifying the will of God. And that's the purpose of change. And God in his mercy lets me go through things to get my attention. He's doing that. God is trying to get our attention. I can't tell you how thankful I am he cornered me in isolation, spiritual isolation at the Naval Academy. No church, no pastor, just me. Me not really knowing how to pray and me not really knowing what the truth was, except what I could regurgitate from what Sunday school teachers said and youth leaders said and pastors said that I couldn't prove to myself even, forget somebody else just repeating what I was told. I'd never made it my truth. It was their truth. And I, I believed it. And that's a good start, but it, you can't live like that. We've got to go beyond that. So the Lord cornered me, and we're rapidly approaching the place in this country right now that he is cornering all of us. Without this crisis, people would be partying. If everybody was told to stay home, given all this time off from work, and there was no crisis, they would be thrilled to death to have all this extra vacation time. But the crisis changes the perceptive perception of all of that. This crisis is bringing a soberness where people are having to confront themselves where they are, where they're going. This is especially true of the Christians. I, I got a text uh, yesterday that from, that was a was sent from a backslider from this church from 25 years ago uh, to one of the ministers in our church that God has been dealing with them all of, through all of this and He's begun to pray again and He's reached out to trying to find out. Okay, I know we're not having church. But I, I want to get back. I want to be involved. I want to be a part of the body. I want to be saved. Tell me how I can participate now. Well, if the Lord is getting the attention of uh, those that are backsliders, shouldn't he be getting the attention of those who never miss a service but don't really know him? Believers are being forced to ask themselves Hard questions. Do I really believe in God? If so, do I really know him? Uh, if not, what am I going to do about this gross spiritual immaturity of mine? Am I going to continue to rely on others and their prayers and what they're getting from the Bible? Or am I going to grow up in God and become a mature person who knows how to pray on my own, not only to hear from God, but to speak to God? and to know how to feed myself from the Word of God. The church service-based Christian culture where people's whole relationship with God is founded solely and totally dependent and is totally dependent upon attending church does not and cannot by itself produce spiritually mature disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to read that one more time. The Lord gave this to me few days ago. The church service-based Christian culture that is our culture 
where people's whole relationship with God is founded solely and is totally dependent upon attending church services and activities, does not and cannot by itself produce spiritually mature disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Never has and never will. So let's for a moment or two here, let's look at the spiritual characteristics of the qualities of truly spiritually mature saints. Now, I'm not using the word saint as opposed to preacher because any preacher that's not a saint, God doesn't claim. Because I have to be a saint as the foundational qualification to ever be utilized by any office or gifting of God in leading the body of Christ. So what are the spiritual characteristics and qualities of a truly spiritually mature saint? Some of them, this is not a, an exhaustive example. I'm just trying to get you to think. The Holy Ghost is just trying to get us to think. The spiritually mature saint lives a life of prayer that is not based or motivated by need or crisis. It's a life of pr- prayer. It's a lifestyle of prayer. The spiritually mature Don't try to get prayer done as a religious obligation or as a task of their day. Let's see, here's my to-do list for today. Pray and then do this, this, no, 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 no. You can't make biblical prayer a task to complete each day. It can't be done. And if that's what prayer is to you, God bless you. I'd like to see that book, chapter, and verse, though. And I know for years, because I was born My mother was attending a United Pentecostal church when I was born, and I've heard it all my life. Prayer time. Got to have a prayer time. Yeah, well, okay, you got to have a prayer time. I got a prayer time. At the very least, from the time I wake up till the time I go to sleep, and I have had many nights where I had prayer, consciously or subconsciously, awake or in a dream I was praying. Well, you're different, brother, right? God have mercy that that's not the case. Because he says he's no respecter of persons. And this is the life and the lifestyle he wants us to have. I don't want a prayer life. I want a life of prayer. Because a prayer life simply means somehow you have worked prayer into your busy schedule. I don't want prayer as a part of my busy schedule. I want all of my schedule as a part of life of prayer. That no matter where I am and what I'm doing, consciously or subconsciously, openly or privately in here, I'm communicating with God all the time. If I stay connected with him, I'm always receiving from him. You know, we're in the world of connection. And if my device, iPad, iPhone, uh laptop, computer, if they're com- connected to a to uh, any kind of Wi-Fi or data signal, I not only can send messages out, I can get messages in. But if something happens to that connection, I can't communicate either way. I can sit there and type emails all I want. I can sit and type text messages all I want. But I'm not communicating because there's no connection. And how much prayer do we pray that we call prayer, that there's no connection. He's not hearing me, and I'm not hearing him. So the spiritually mature live a life of prayer where they understand first and foremost the foundational requirement of biblical prayer is a connection, a two-way communication connection. Because a lot of times prayer is not talking at all. A lot of times prayer is listening. And I have many days, if you follow Facebook at all, I have many days, not every day, many days where I'm praying and he's talking and I stop and have to write that down. I won't remember all that. I won't remember any of it a lot of times. So I stop and write it down. Well, you're not, then you stop praying. No, I'm not stopping praying at all. 
Prayer's two-way communication. He's talking, I'm writing it down. That's prayer. I, some of the greatest prayer meetings I've ever had, I didn't say a word in English, but I listened to a whole lot. Prayer's not saying a bunch of stuff just to get it said. Now, I believe in kingdom prayer. And the spiritually mature saint who lives a life of prayer, their life of prayer is based on their relationship and commitment to God to be a participant in the Father's kingdom. So kingdom prayer is ultimately one of the most important focuses of their day. And there are specific things Jesus taught us to pray for every day. And the spiritually mature do. And the spiritually immature just pray to tell him all of what their will is, what they need, what they want, what, uh, what uh, they think ought to be done, and how it ought to be done, and when, and where, and whatever. So we got all these instructions for God. You, you listen to some people pray, and you wonder who's God and who's the servant. Because the only one talking and the one giving all the instructions and direction is the one doing the praying, not the one they're praying to. I know for a lot of folks, that's all they know about prayer. Isn't prayer for us to be able to go tell God what we want? Uh, not what I read in the book. In fact, he told me specifically, and you too, in Matthew 6, there's some things we're not even supposed to pray about because we've got a heavenly father that already knows what we need. And so while we're praying about all the stuff he already knows about, we're not praying about his kingdom. That's in the book. Everybody can read that if you want. It's in there. But what do we pray? How many people pray, consider themselves people who pray, who pray about stuff that Jesus specifically said that we shouldn't be praying about because that's what the Gentiles seek after. And when I pray like that, you know what I'm saying? I don't really have a father. I don't really have a father. I can't trust him to know what I need and take care of that so that I can focus on his kingdom. That's why I'm not praying to be protected from the virus. I don't have to. I have a promise, and this is the promise. Luke chapter 10 and verse 19. Jesus said, behold, I give you power. That's King James' word. The Greek word is authority. It's not dunamis. It's exousia. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions. He's not talking about the, 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 the animals, if you want to call them animals. I guess they are. They're not plant. Tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Ah, there it is. He's giving you the context. And he says, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Somebody needs to be listening to me right now. The fearful believer who is in survival mode, just praying to be protected from this sickness, God has no obligation to do that for you. But the child of God, who is a part of the kingdom of God, who is obeying the word of God and praying against the spirits that he identified as serpents and scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy that's trying to blind the lost of this world and of the church through tradition, and all of this stuff the adversary is, supposed to, is trying to do that is not the will of God for him to be able to do yet until the rapture, we're supposed to be praying against that. That's what Call to War 2020 is about. One of the things it's about is us being that with letting the Holy Ghost through the body of Christ and the earth be that which is withholding the spirit or the mystery of iniquity. Only he who now letteth will let till he be taken out of the way. The word let there in the Greek is the same Greek word as the word withholdeth in the previous verse of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Same Greek word. And the word literally means to restrain. The adversary's not restraining himself. He's not restraining himself. The Holy Ghost through the body of Christ is the restrainer. But the Lord's counting on us to let him pray those prayers of restraint through us. But what are we praying for? Oh, God, protect us from this virus. Oh, God, don't let us get sick. Oh, God, we don't want to hear what you're saying. We don't want to repent. We don't want to change. We just want you to heal us and protect us so we can keep on living like we've always been living. 
Oh, I don't, I'm not trying to make you angry, but there's a couple of folks got angry about that, didn't you? Because truth hurts, doesn't it? And God is supposed to let his church, the body of Christ, the conduit through which he intends to fulfill his word to, so that he's not a liar, so that he completes all of his word in the earth, and that conduit he spoke, that, that is not focused on that. We're trying to build a crowd. We're not preaching the gospel to every creature. We're trying to build a crowd. We're only preaching the gospel to those that we can get to come to our buildings. We're not preaching the gospel to every creature. We're not obeying the word of God. It's not whether or not they'll come to my church and pay tithes here that tells me whether or not I preach to them. Sometimes God puts us in situations to witness to people that will never, ever benefit us personally at all just to see what our motive is. And if our whole focus is only to reach those that are going to be a part of our crowd and put money in our offerings, our motives are wrong, and he is not in favor of that. We're not trying to reach a lost world. I mean, what would we do? What would be our motive? If tomorrow morning we woke up in headlines, in the night something supernatural happened and every person in our city received the Holy Ghost and somehow got baptized in Jesus' name, except for one soul, would we have any burden left? Would we have any motivation left? Would, would our burden diminish at all? Would our prayers change at all? Would our focus change at all if everybody in our city got saved and they were going to some other place to church and there's only one person left and uh, they're not going to come to our church, but they're left and we've got an opportunity to finish it out and win that lust soul. What's our motive and attitude going to be then? What's our approach going to be then? Are we going to preach the gospel to every creature? There's one left. Or are we going to say, well, they're not coming to our church, so I'm just not going to do anything. And you think our Heavenly Father that's got nail scars in his hands and feet, that's got a scar on his side, his back looked like a plowed field, he's got thorn scars, and his face, according to Isaiah 52, his visage is marred more than any man. He did all of that to reach the lost, and his body is just trying to build a crowd in a church building, really? And I've said it before, I'm saying it again. It is the will of God for the church to come together. Now, right now, God is not letting that happen because the pendulum is so far out here, it's all church, 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 and we mean building, 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 building. Everything's got to happen here. It's all got to happen here. And he's moving that pendulum. He's moved it all the way out here. And he's not letting it come back to the middle till we repent. I said repent. I didn't say because repentance is change. And we're not going to change without repentance because we can't change by ourselves. Only God can change us. Only God can change us. So what are we going to do here? Again. Behold, I give you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Because God does not protect and defend those that are on the defense. He protects and defends those that are on the offense. That's his promise. His promise is to protect those who are on the spiritual offensive. Who are on the offensive in the spirit. Now, friend of mine was going to have a prayer meeting to bind the coronavirus. Well, two days later, he had to have a prayer meeting in the homes because the coronavirus crisis shut his prayer meeting in the church down. And I'm not making fun of it. I'm not binding the coronavirus because I'm not binding what God is allowing. And binding and loosing has to originate from heaven. The Greek is literally... Whatsoever you bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have already been loosed in heaven. That's, that's, we're praying for the will of God to be done. But the, the Greek is literally there. <clears throat> that 
we're, we're supposed to be praying for the will, will of God as it's already purposed in heaven to prevail in the earth. Now, why do we have to pray all that? Because God is the only one with the authority to limit himself to not do anything in the earth except through human agency. And how many times the Old Testament was he seeking for a man, looking for an intercessor to do his work? And when he couldn't find one, he had to become a man. That's how limited he is by his own plan. That he couldn't even save the world. When he couldn't find a man, he couldn't save the world without himself becoming a man. And he's not going to do anything in the earth today except through human agency. And what human agency is that? Well, during that 33 plus years or so, when the man Christ Jesus was here on the earth, it was through that human agency. But Christ said, he that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also and greater works than these shall he do because I go unto my father. Why? Because by him going to the father, he goes from being Christ to the head of the body. And then on the day of Pentecost, some 50 days after his resurrection, he created the body that he's now the head of. And everything that Christ done in the earth, he's going to do through his own body. He's not going to do this outside his body. He's going to do it through his body. Well, what if the body is not listening to the head? What if the body is just wanting to do its own thing over here, you know? <laughs> what if the body's doing that? Which is exactly what the body's been doing. Well, guess what? Our Father, out of love and mercy and compassion, has shut the body down from all of its activities that we call spiritual and saying, here's my focus. The armor of God. The armor of God protects the, the spiritual soldier on the offensive. It doesn't protect the retreating soldier who's running from the adversary. It doesn't. You want to get over your fear? Go on the offensive. Not against the coronavirus, but go on the offensive against the spirit of iniquity of this world, against the spirit of idolatry, the spirit of witchcraft, the spirit of blindness on the lost, the spirit of religious tradition, and anything else like that that are serpents and scorpions and, and, the, and expressions of the power of the enemy. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Coronavirus can only affect flesh and blood, but against principalities powers, rulers of the darkness of this world, and Wicked spirits in the heavenlies, according to the Greek. So what are we doing about this? The spiritually mature are involved with him and his kingdom. The spiritually immature are just doing enough to try to stay saved according to what they think or they've been told is necessary to do to be saved. Now, the whole idea that God is such a God of love, he's going to find some way to save people even if they don't obey him and submit to his will is proven wrong by the fact that eight were the only ones saved because of the only ones that obeyed him. And the whole world was destroyed. Now, you can fuss about whether that's a good God or all that. that that's your problem. That's between you and God. My God is a God of love. But he also says what he means and means what he says. Noah preached for 125 years while he was building on that ark. They had 125 years to repent. Yeah. And what has it been since the day of the outpouring of the Holy Ghost at the end, in the end time? By our knowledge, not God may know something else. I'm sure he does, but... The ones that we've recognized, it was the 1st of January, uh, 19, or two, 1901, if I remember correctly. So what has that been now? 120 years or so, we've been preaching to a world that's lost. Nah, one of these days, he's going to put the believers in the ark and shut the door. And instead of rain coming down this time, it's going to be fire. Now, 
what I've said this over and over. What is a God of love and mercy supposed to do when he cannot violate his own word without undeifying himself? And it's impossible for him to lie. What is he supposed to do? What are the limits that we think should be on a God of love to, in his efforts to try to persuade people to be saved? He can't make anybody be saved. But what is he supposed to do? What, what are our limits? What kind of limits do we want him to put on his efforts to reach our unsaved loved ones? What's the limits? What's the limits? What are the limits that we expect a God of love to have? What are those limits? What limits would we put on a God of love? trying to get the attention of his body and us get prayed through. <laughs> you say, well, we're the church. We're having church. We're, we're, not, we're not lost. So Israel, <laughs> in the days of Christ, they were all saved. They went to the synagogue. They were still going to the temple. They were doing all their religious stuff. And Jesus called them the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, if he is not lying, then he's not lying now saying it through me or any other preacher that dares to say the church needs to pray through. We have so given ourselves to coddling, uncommitted people to get them to keep coming to our crowd. I'm not talking about purposely running somebody off, but the word of God sifts. The word of God discerns the heart. And maybe we don't want to know what's in people's hearts. We just want them to keep sitting there in our crowd and putting their money in the plate and letting them go to hell because nobody's calling them to repentance. Now, is everybody going to hear that message? No. Are some going to get angry? Yes. Are some going to leave? Yes. Are they going to badmouth us? When has that not been the case for 2,000 years of the church history? But if you're trying to avoid all that, then you're trying to please men. You're not pleasing God. If I seek to please men, Paul said, I am not the servant of Christ. And you know when he said that? He said that in first in Galatians chapter 1, right after he said, If I or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, he's a curse. He said, I'll say it again. If any man or an angel preach any other gospel unto you than that which I preached unto you, let him be accursed. He said, I'm speaking this message. And, you know, and I'm paraphrasing now, and it's not pleasing some of you, but if I'm seeking to please men by what I say, I am not the servant of Christ. I am not the servant of Christ. If I'm more concerned about what people think about what I'm saying, then I think then I'm, I'm concerned about what God is being able to say through my mouth or not being allowed to say. I'm a pleaser of people, and I'm not a servant of Christ. It's really that plain, folks. It's really that simple. Some people call this being really direct. You mean saying it so there's no question what's being said? That's unkind? S saying it so there you can't go say, uh, well, he didn't really mean that. I meant it because God meant it. God meant it. <sighs> Spiritually mature believers can feed themselves from the word of God. And when they do that, they'll be teachers. Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 through 14, among other places. Spiritually mature disciples can hear the voice of God for themselves. Romans 10, 7, uh, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So the word there is rhema, not logos. So therefore, anybody that can't hear the voice of God for themselves and know it, they can't have faith. They don't have faith. Faith in logos alone is not enough. According to the word of God, I've got to be able to hear the voice of God. You got to be able to hear the voice of God. The spiritually mature know how to walk in the Spirit and how to be led of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. For as many, uh, if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And the last part of that chapter says, and if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. And Romans 8 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. No period there. The sentence keeps going. The verse keeps going. To them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, 
but after the Spirit. And Romans 8, 14 says, uh, they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. And some translations say, they that are led by the Spirit of God, they only are the sons of God. And then the spiritually mature saints are submitted to spiritual authority and desire to be a part of the ministry of the body of Christ rather than to be the object of that ministry. Spiritually mature followers of Jesus are more concerned about ministering to others than getting anything for themselves. Spiritually mature Christians know how to teach the Word of God for others. All of these statements are very easily demonstrated by an abundance of scriptures. It is God's very specific scriptural goal for every believer to know him personally and have their own relationship with him that is not dependent upon anyone. Why? Because true spiritual maturity makes us givers, not takers. Well, if people grow up like that, they won't want to come to church. If they don't want to come and assemble with the body of Christ, as the word of God says, then they didn't grow up. They got deceived because a truly spiritual mature person, spiritually mature person, wants to be a part of the body so that they can be a part of ministering to others, both in the body and as sent out by the body. Because to be truly a spiritually mature person, I don't do it on my own. I allow the spiritual authority that God has put me under by the Holy Ghost to do the sending for ministry. It's one thing to go into ministry. It's another thing to be sent by God. A lot of people have gone out into the ministry that God did not send. The church did not send. The pastor did not send. But God didn't send. The Greek word translated sin is or send, S-E-N-D, is apostello, which is the Greek root word for apostle. In other words, for any of us, we must be sent. Do you think God sends the spiritually immature? I wouldn't send a two-year-old child out uh, to plow a field. I wouldn't send a I wouldn't give a sickle into the hands of a two-year-old child to go reap a field. But we've got to grow people up so they can be laborers in the body of Christ. True spiritual maturity, spiritual maturity makes us givers, not takers. The truly spiritual mature child of God is involved in his kingdom first as their daily effort. As Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, the focus of the spiritual, spiritually mature saint is the kingdom of God every day. They're not seeking for things from God. They're seeking for the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and he adds those things he wants us to have. If he's not giving it, I don't want it. And if he's giving it, I want want it whether I think I want it or need it or not. So I want to seek his kingdom. And what he gives or doesn't give is up to him. What I want more than anything else for him to give is an opportunity to be a part of his kingdom, to see his promises come to pass. I want to be a part of that. I've lived all my life to be a part of that. And we're closer to that than we've ever been. And the little bit of revival that God has given us, and I thank God for every soul that's been saved, that summer touting is so great. That isn't the harvest. All he's trying to do is save some people that are going to be laborers in that harvest. But if we're just counting them as harvest and we're putting them in jars for storage like we would wheat, rather than training and equipping them to be laborers in the harvest, we don't have faith. We don't have faith in the promises. It's not what he talked about. So while I have great compassion on those who are are or will become sick of this virus and or the hardships that many are going or will go through because of it, I am exceedingly thankful that our God loves us so much that he has permitted this time of isolation that allows him to arrest our total focus and attention so that he can speak to us, his people, both individually and personally. I am very thankful for what he has done. The scripture says that Jesus said, my house 
shall be called a house of prayer. From God's perspective, prayer has been and always will be the first and foremost priority he has for us, and it is the life that the spiritually mature live. Now, we're going to go a little longer in this briefing than I have in the past, but I'm saying this to you right now, and I'm going to close with this. The number one quality, characteristic, activity of the spiritually mature is the place that prayer has in their lives. If prayer is not the first and continual priority of my day, I am not spiritually mature. It is the number one characteristic of a spiritually mature relationship with God. And if prayer is not my first priority of the day and my first and foremost priority the rest of the day, then I am not yet spiritually mature. The good news is the Lord is doing his best to bring us to that place. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you will receive this in the Spirit from the Spirit of God and not from a man. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that he would give you spiritual discernment to know whether or not this is a man talking or God talking through a man. In the name of Jesus, I pray the grace of God upon us that we would allow him to empower us both the will and to do of those things that please him. God bless you in Jesus' name. I love you.